And now the word of God. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. He was wounded. The cross is the only ladder high enough to touch heaven's threshold. And it was at the cross that Jesus was mortally wounded so that your sins and mine could be forgiven. He was wounded. It sounds like such a simple statement, but do we really grasp the full significance of those words? He was wounded with words and weapons, both piercing him like daggers. Let's hear those beautiful words once more from the pen of the statesman prophet Isaiah, who painted that masterpiece of his suffering in Isaiah chapter 53, verses two through six. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him, Jesus, the iniquities of us all. It is here in Isaiah 53 that the Old Testament ceases to be root, branches, and leaves and becomes the precious fruit of redemption that is to come at Calvary. It is not so much that he was wounded for our transgressions, but that he was wounded for our transgressions. It's not that he was bruised for our iniquities, but that he was bruised for our iniquities. It is not that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, but that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All that he suffered, he suffered for us. All that he bore, he bore for us. He was wounded for us. He was bruised for us. He was nailed to the cross for us. He died alone for us. And he went to hell for us. And after three days, he came forth the victor over death, hell, and the grave for us. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of preaching a, a soul-winning campaign at the Philippines International Convention Center in Manila. And as a part of that, we did some videotaping for television and went to a procession through the streets of Manila by, by the flagellantists, those who, who beat themselves and tortured themselves and some were nailed to the cross. They said, for a sacrifice for Jesus Christ. It seemed to me that they may have forgotten that Jesus did all of this for us. He was our substitute. He died a substitutionary vicarious death for us, for you and me. That's why he came. That's why he died. That's why he suffered. It was done for us so that we wouldn't have to, so that we could walk free. That's justification. We became just as if we had never committed one sin before. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 20, the Word of God lets us know with crystal clarity, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling down of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, God said, I will not hear. He said, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Again, Jesus Christ was wounded for us. Let's never forget it. Let's make no mistake. His greatest sufferings were not physical. His greatest pains were not the whippings and the nails. It was God's abandonment of Jesus when he became the personification of sin while hanging upon that cross. Mere physical pain is describable, but the agony that Jesus suffered is indescribable. Adding the describable to the indescribable should cause us to love Jesus more than ever before. I was intrigued years ago by an article written by a noted physician, Dr. C. Truman Davis, on the subject of the crucifixion of Jesus. Dr. Davis points out the physiological phenomenon of Christ's initial suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, a bloody sweat. He points out that it was reported by the only physician among the disciples, Dr. Luke. Though very rare, the phenomenon of hematidosis or bloody sweat is well documented. According to Dr. Davis, under great emotional stress, tiny capillaries in the sweat glands can break, causing blood to mix with sweat. Jesus' first wound was concussion. After the arrest of Jesus in the middle of the night, he was brought before the Sanhedrin. And it was here that the first physical wound was inflicted. The burly hand of a soldier struck Jesus across the face for being silent when being questioned. Then Jesus was blindfolded and taunted as each of the soldiers passed by and struck, in, struck him in the face and spat upon him. Centuries earlier, Micah had prophesied, they shall smite the judge of Israel with the rod upon the cheek. In Isaiah 50 and 6, we find these telling words, and I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Early the next morning, Jesus, bruised and battered and exhausted from a sleepless night, was taken across Jerusalem to Governor Pilate. Most Roman scholars from this period believe that Pilate originally ordered Jesus scourged as his full punishment, that the death sentence on the cross came only in response to the prodding of the mob. Suddenly, I hear the clotting of Roman sandals shuffling down the cobblestone stairs to the musty dungeon where Jesus is stripped of his clothing and his hands are tied to a whipping post where he suffered his second wound, laceration. Please note those hands tied to the whipping post. Those are not the hands of a criminal, nor the hands of a malefactor or a traitor. Those hands lifted little children into his arms and caressed away their cares. These hands lifted the daughter of Jairus from the couch of death, and she started living. These hands touched the eyes of the blind, and they started seeing. These hands touched the ears of the deaf, and they started hearing. These hands touched the tongue of the tongue of the dumb, and they started singing. These hands touched crooked, crippled bodies, and they started moving and walking. These hands touched the skin of lepers, and they were cleansed. These hands touched fevered brows, and they were cooled. These hands were raised during a raging storm, and the storm was quieted. These hands distributed meager food to the multitude, and it was multiplied. These same hands of deliverance are outstretched to you, wherever you are, whoever you are. The Roman legionnaire steps forward with a flagrum or flagellum in his hand. This is a thick, short whip. Several heavy leather thongs with two small balls of lead embedded near the ends makes a formidable weapon. Again, Jesus is wounded. And again, he was wounded for us. The heavy whip is savagely brought down with full force across Jesus' shoulders, back, and legs. Laceration is hardly the word to describe what happened. As the blows continue, the leather and metal cuts deeper into the subcutaneous tissues, first causing an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of his skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. Ugly bruises are broken open by subsequent blows until the skin of his back is hanging in ribbons of unrecognizable masses of torn, bleeding tissue. In fact, 
Some scholars believe that he was beaten so horribly that his intestines were literally exposed. The Bible says, the plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. He said again, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair in Isaiah 50 and 6. Beads of perspiration break out on the Roman soldier as he plows open the back of Jesus. His muscles glisten in the dimly lit dungeon as he brutally tore open the back of Jesus Christ. Little did he realize that he was plowing out the sicknesses and diseases of God's people, for with his stripes you are healed. When the soldier in charge determines that the prisoner is near death, the beating is finally mercifully stopped. Half fainting, Jesus is finally untied and is allowed to slump to the cobblestone floor, wet with his own blood and fragments of his own flesh. His third wound is perforation. Sadistic in their macabre sense of humor, the Roman soldiers throw a robe across his shoulders and place a stick in his hand for a scepter. A small bundle of flexible branches plaited with long piercing thorns, possibly the Arabian Naba, is fashioned in the shape of a crown and is jammed into his scalp. Again, there is copious bleeding. They jerked the stick from his hand and beat him across the head and face and smote him again and again with their hands, driving those thorns even deeper into his scalp. Finally, they get tired of their sadistic joke. The robe is torn angrily from his throbbing back. The robe had very probably become adherent to the clots of blood and serum in the wounds. Its removal, according to Dr. Davis, just as in the careless removal of a surgical bandage, causes excruciating pain, almost as though he were again being whipped, and the wounds again begin to bleed. His garments are returned out of deference to Jewish tradition. He lifts his cross, and the procession to Calvary begins its slow, painful, arduous journey along the Via Dolorosa. He tries hard to carry his cross, but weakened by his horrible ordeal and the copious loss of blood, he stumbles and falls. The rough wood of the beam digs into the lacerated skin as he vainly tries to get up. The Roman soldier, eager to get on with the crucifixion, selects a robust-looking North African onlooker, Simon of Cyrene, to help with his cross. The 650-yard journey to Golgotha is finally completed, and again he is stripped of his clothing except for a loincloth. The legionnaire probes for the depression at the front of the wrist. He lifts a heavy mallet and inflicts Jesus with a fourth wound, incision. He lifts his mallet and drives the long nail through the wrist and deep into the wood, and then the other hand. The left foot is pressed backward against the right foot. With both feet extended, toes down, a nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The cross is lifted into the air between heaven and earth. And Jesus winces as it falls into its place with an agonizing, sickening thud. Dr. Davis then describes the crucifixion this way. He says the victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more and more weight on the nails and the wrists, excruciating fiery pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrists are putting pressure on the median nerves as he pushed himself upward to avoid this stretching torment. He placed his full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, there was searing agony as the nail tore through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet. As the arms fatigue, great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, pectoral muscles are paralyzed, and the intercostal muscles are unable to act. Air can be drawn into the lungs, and the bloodstream and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in the life-giving oxygen. Hours of this limitless pain 
cycles of twisting, joint-rending cramps, intermittent partial asphyxiation, searing pain as tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough timber. Then another agony begins, a crushing pain deep in the chest as a pericardium slowly fills with serum and begins to compress his heart. The Bible prophesied in Psalm 2 and 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Not one bone in his body was broken. This in itself is a miraculous fulfillment of prophecy. In order to be our Passover and true Paschal Lamb, not a bone of his body was to be broken. Centuries earlier, Moses had commanded, not a bone shall be broken thereof of the sacrificial lamb. In the very hour when the Passover lambs were being sacrificed in Jerusalem, in fulfillment of that ancient prophetic rite, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the whole world, cried out from the cross in little more than a tortured whisper, It is finished. It's almost over now. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues. The tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to gasp in small gulps of air. His first recorded words as a small boy of 12 were these, Know you not that I must be about my father's business? And among his last words were, It is finished. His father's business was finished. His mission of redemption was completed. Salvation's wondrous work was final. And his blood still has its power. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1 and 7 says. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Ever since that fountain of cleansing blood was opened at Calvary, millions have received forgiveness and pardon in its life-giving flow. On Calvary's ground, we all become the same size in God's eyes. Forgiveness, complete forgiveness is available to you right now. But Jesus, you may ask, what about that soldier who jammed that thorn-made crown into your bleeding brow? Can he be forgiven? And Jesus would say, yes. Tell him that I'll give him a crown of righteousness to wear forever. But Jesus, what about that legionnaire who shoved that imitation scepter in your hand and mocked you as a king? Can he ever be forgiven? And Jesus would say, yes. Tell him that I'll grant him an authentic scepter of divine royal sonship. But Jesus, what about those soldiers who ravage your garments and gamble for them at the foot of your cross? Can they ever be forgiven? And Jesus would say, tell them I'll place around their shoulders the garments of salvation. But Jesus, what about that Roman soldier who drove those massive spikes through your hands on the cross? Can he ever be forgiven? And again, Jesus would say, tell him that I will take all his sins in my nail-scarred hands. I will cast all his sins into my sea of forgetfulness to be remembered against him no more. But Jesus, what about that soldier who offered vinegar for you to drink in your dying moments? Can he be forgiven, ever forgiven? And Jesus would say, tell him that I'll give him to drink of the water of life freely. That is why Jesus suffered and bled and died so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And he was wounded for you and me. But again, the severest wounds were not physical. His greatest pains were not the whippings and the nails. He died of a broken heart with your sins and my sins on his own soul. And when God saw the sin on his soul, he turned his back on his only son. And he died alone, forsaken wounded. 
Someone said that Christ's death on the cross was the greatest moment in the moral history of God. We're being told today that it was nothing more or less than a mere example of sacrificial love, but it was a revelation of God's compassion. It was God constraining man to repent by revealing to him what sin does to a holy God of infinite love. There are a thousand theories current today, but if the cross doesn't cause you and me to remove our shoes from our feet and tread softly, there is no hope for us. If this doesn't break your pride, nothing ever will. In 1 Peter 2 and 24, Peter declared that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. And your salvation in this moment is as simple and as powerful as this. Confess your sins. Repent of your sins. Forsake your sins. Believe in his cleansing blood for the remission of your sins. Ah, oh, friend, please don't leave this service with blood on the bottom of your shoes, trampling underfoot his mercy and forgiveness. But when this service will have ended, may you have his cleansing blood applied to your soul as a covering for your sins. Jesus was wounded, but he was not wounded in vain. He was wounded for your sins and mine. So let's go together to the foot of the cross right now in prayer, shall we? Lord Jesus, how can we ever thank you enough for all that you've done for us? You bore our sins in your body. Your father forsook you while you hung on the cross because he saw our sins on your soul. And you died there alone, forsaken, wounded. But Jesus, your death will not be in vain for my friend who prays with me right now, who now opens their heart's door to you. Come in, Lord Jesus. Come in. Thank you for saving this soul. Fill this place where my friend is right now with your forgiving presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen.